Hello. So, now it's time to talk about animals, food, and artificial intelligence. And, spoiler, I'll tell you right where I'm going with this probably also half hour long ramble, since that's been the length of my previous two videos, is to say that, well, people used to make this analogy of why to be afraid of the robots and artificial intelligence in general, uh, which is like, well, there's things that are less intelligent than us on this planet, but that are still very much alive and capable of thought. Uh, and what do we do with them? Uh, pretty much horrible, horrible things that we would never want done to us. Uh, so yeah, um, people used to make that analogy a lot. I find in the last five, ten years they have been making it less and less, and I don't quite know why, because it's not like the meat and dairy industries weren't there before. Uh, they were, and it's not like artificial intelligence has faded from the public consciousness. It hasn't. The only explanation I can think of is it's gotten a little too real in the last few years where AI has... Even there though, AI has not making some huge... Obviously there's been deep learning which has changed things and also Moore's Law has continued although it has slowed a little bit. So I don't know why, but people used to make this analogy all the time of like, oh, you know, they would also make it for, you know, oh, what if aliens, which that, you know, I, I don't think that would be quite how they would turn up. I, you know, of course, I think that the, the, the aliens would be like the Vulcans, right, where the Vulcans are all vegans, basically, right, and they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, all highly logical, and that's a, that's a major thing, is that uh, Spock doesn't eat meat, uh, and in fact, there's an episode where he, he sort of has having a, a, a breakdown. Uh, it's, it's in the episode of Mock Time, which uh, is cheesy uh, and wonderful uh, and campy, like, oh, so many Star Trek episodes, but there, there's, there's a point where he says, like, I have consumed the flesh of an animal, and, and so it's, and this, is, this is a sign to him that he has, he's fallen far, and so I'd like to think that aliens, yeah, just wouldn't do that sort of thing. But anyways, people used to make this analogy with artificial intelligence a lot, right, of like, you know, you know, we have sort of cattle and uh, pigs and chickens, and we just sort of treat them like objects, and so eventually what's going to happen when we build artificial intelligence systems that are, you know, leaps and bounds more intelligent than us, and I don't think they're going to eat us, but yeah, the analogy is that anything that we are useful for, uh, they will just do to us, uh, regardless of how it feels for us, regardless of our objections, regardless of anything, because that's pretty much what we do with animals, right? They, uh, you know, in a lot, in a lot of classical agricultural civilizations, it wasn't that bad, right? Because animals definitely were being killed and eaten and used, but, you know, they just kind of were being kept in, like, you know, wood, you know, wood fence pens, but in, in modern times we do things to animals that are unbelievably awful. And so the analogy, of course, would be like, okay, well, you know, it's not clear what we'll be useful for, but if there's a situation where we build a world where that's just what happens, and then something along comes something that's much more intelligent than us, well, it's just gonna not care how much it hurts us if there's something useful it can get from us, right? And so, and if it can just get a little bit more of that thing out of us, just like if we can get a little bit more uh, meat or other animal products out of animals, you know, who cares if their, you know, quality of life, you know, is, is absolutely abysmal and who cares if they're in incredible amounts of pain and crammed in these barns and things, right? And so that's the thing, right, is if we don't care, then it's like, okay, well, why would some giant supercomputer give a shit if, you know, the, you know, the, you know, whatever thing it needs from us causes us horrible pain? Uh, it wouldn't. And yeah, so there, there's these things, all these things about AI safety. And so I guess, you know, right from the get-go, that's sort of my hot take, right, is that the, 
uh, the best path to AI safety is nothing to do with the technology. Uh, that's just going to evolve sort of no matter what we do uh, because there will be something useful that can be done with the AI and as long as that's the case people will continue to build it and for now it is clear what we're useful for you know we're useful to build uh, more sophisticated hardware and write more sophisticated software and so you know I don't know but it also does not appear to be the case that well, it depends on what you mean, right? Is that, you know, uh, AI can beat humans at a lot of things, but by and large, it does seem that humans are still, actually, maybe we're not exactly in control, but there's no, you know, robots walking down the street with access to a thousand times more knowledge than humans. And yeah, in some sense, your phone has a thousand times more knowledge than you, but not really, not yet. And so, I should mention in all this, I'm not vegan, right? I am not even a very good vegetarian in that I have periodically downgraded to pescatarian and started eating fish, uh, which I'm trying not to do that again. Uh, it's actually kind of easier now that I'm living in a place where there isn't really, uh, I mean, you can get anything anywhere nowadays but there's not really like delicious fresh fish here in New Mexico the way there was in coastal California. And I mean, there's still sushi and poke shops and, um, you know, fried, fried fish tacos. And, you know, if you, without that much difficulty, uh, you can find all of those things because there's, you know, freezing and refrigeration and shipping. So you can get anything anywhere, but uh, I don't know, it just doesn't feel as, as thematic, right? Uh, whereas, you know, you go, you, you go and see the beautiful ocean and you're like, oh, and then there's this poke shop right down the road. Let me just go have some fish. Um, anyway, I think it's, well, I, I don't know, it, it's just, it's a bit easier. And I, I haven't, since I, since I moved to New Mexico, I haven't had any fish. And I'm trying to keep it that way, uh, see if I can. Uh, but I'm not a vegan, right? I, I eat dairy products and I eat eggs. Uh, which is in part because eggs are in everything. It's hard to avoid them unless you're super like picky and look at the ingredients on everything and try to make absolutely certain. And also cheese is my favorite food stuff in existence, probably. Uh, and ice cream is my second favorite. Uh, although there's a lot of good vegan ice creams out there. There's plenty of really good coconut ice cream. And uh, actually there's a fair amount of good soy milk ice cream and other things too. But it's, it's, pretty difficult to get really good vegan cheese right now and that'll probably change in the future but at any rate I'm, I'm not vegan so I'm not speaking from some position of like I am doing these things really well and everybody else needs to do them well too and then the, no no it's like even if I were vegan I would not be trying to talk down to people right because I have I mean everybody always has you know bad habits right I, I, I drive everywhere well you know I, I like to think I'm not the absolute worst about that but uh, still, you know, it, 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 you know, you, you could always be doing better uh, in terms of ethics. And so, uh, especially with regards to consumer choices. And I don't know, I, I guess I'm trying to say I, I can't and don't judge people. But in my mind, the best way to have artificial intelligence safety is to build a world where less intelligent things are not so highly exploited by more intelligent things. Because I don't think there's a way to engineer the algorithms to make it safe. That does not exist. And there's really no way to make that exist. Right? There's lots of good content, even on YouTube, but there's, you know, there's tons of good sort of academic papers from computer scientists and philosophers, uh, as well as pop science books and even just content on YouTube explaining the various ways you might try to engineer AI safety by something like uh, Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics and none of them work like at all there is deep fundamental flaws in everything you try to do to say ah oh, let's build this like one specific rule into into the algorithm and we'll just like you know code it into the to the, some part of it where it really is on it's like no 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 it's it's you, you can't it there is no way um, I think the only way to make AI safer is to make a world where 
just because you're not the most powerful thing in the world doesn't mean that you're going to get like completely destroyed and used and abused and exploited by everything else that's more powerful and capable and intelligent than you because we're building things that are more powerful and capable intelligent and intelligent than ourselves right uh computers can already beat us at these like you know relatively well-defined problems like chess or go or anything like that really and the number of things that computers cannot do shrinks every year and I am somebody that thinks that well, it always is just a matter of time and it, it's not clear what the actual specific especially hardware implementations will be that do that but I'm a firm believer that eventually we'll get there uh, and it may well be that part of the answer is actually to couple things to living systems right it might be that you know you do some horrible thing where you put neurons um, you know, you put like neurons in a, not a vat necessarily, but right, you put neurons in a, in some sort of medium such that they're, you know, provided with nutrients and then you wire them up to a chip, which is something people already do as an experiment. Uh, and it may well be that that's actually how you produce true artificial intelligence more capable than people. Uh, and it may be that that artificial intelligence exists in a great deal of pain and agony because it is part biological. Um, but even that would not stop it from existing. And, you know, if it is in horrible pain so much, that would be even worse, right? Because one, we would be responsible for something uh, horrible and unethical. And then two, uh, if it's in horrible pain and its creators put it in that state, then that gives it even less of a reason to give a crap if the things that it needs from us cause us horrible pain, right? So the situation on the whole could get just exceedingly grim dark exceedingly quickly and um well maybe you know i guess i haven't proved much evidence that it could go exceedingly quickly but uh moore's law you know uh, well i guess Moore, moore's law has 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 sort of you know like slowed down a little bit because we can only shrink transistors so much um but it the capabilities of computers will continue to increase even if we can't excuse me really shrink transistors anymore there's other ways to continue to improve performance per cost uh, and even per sort of material expenditure. And so, yeah, I am a vegetarian for reasons other than this. I am a vegetarian because I just love animals. I, you know, I, I absolutely love seeing animals in nature, uh, experiencing a, a real full life. Uh, I love wildlife. I love going snorkeling. And I love going out to the wilderness and the mountains and the woods and seeing animals just roaming around doing their thing. Uh, I was just up in the mountains the other day and I, I, I mean, they were just some deer, but it was, it was a wonderful thing to see. And I also do, I like pets. I have mixed feelings about pets because it depends on what kind of life they're given. Um, you know, especially a lot of things like, you know, small mammals kept in small cages um, probably don't have very good lives. Uh, I, I grew up with outdoor cats um, and I should say that, you know, all the, you know, n now my parents have, have new cats that have not uh, died yet, but I should say, you know, a lot, a lot of those cats did die from various accidents and things being hit by cars, but still, I'm, I think they had better lives than if they had been kept inside. Uh, and I guess there's, there's, there's some people who, you know, say that to truly treat cats well, you should force them to stay inside. I think those people are just like horrible, misguided. They're not evil people, but they are misguided and they are causing huge amounts of pain and suffering for those animals, right? Because it's like, you know, we, we already talk about how like humans are not meant to live this way where we stay inside uh, with all of, our stuff uh, but at least we get to you know go out to our you know go to the grocery well not nowadays with the pandemic right but at least you know um, we well yeah maybe the pandemic is you know sort of uh, poetic justice wrath of God uh, for what we've done to our pets forcing them to stay inside right and what we've done to animals in general now we now we you know what it's like to be forced to, to stay in confined spaces out of fear um, 
yeah, that's something that definitely has occurred to me. I try not to think about it too much. Um, but I, I, I think it's, I think it's much better to have pets that are that are allowed to go outside and run around the way that they're meant to. And it's true that especially with something like an outdoor cat, they are at greater risk. You know, they might die. Uh, none of those cats died super before their time, right? They all lived fairly long, good lives, and then, you know, one day they died. And they didn't all die that way. One of them died because we took him to the vet, and the vet messed up and gave him, like, ten times the dose of deworming that they were supposed to, and he died of essentially poisoning from excess medication. So, you know, there's stuff like that. I'm not saying don't take your pet to the vet, but I'm saying that, you know, um, following the instructions that are supposedly to maximize their lifespan, you know, one, does not necessarily provide them with the best quality of life, and two, uh, might not work anyways, because, you know, people do mess up, even highly educated people. And so, you know, with a dog, you just can't do that, right? Uh, at least by and large you can't. Some people do just keep dogs inside and it's horrible. Uh, but a dog, of course, you, you take them out to, to walk on a leash. A dog you can't uh, really just uh, let roam free because they're a little bit too big and they can potentially do damage. Although, you know, also with dogs, right, the one are they, what, you know, what, when are they often the happiest, right? When you take them to the, to the off-leash park with fenced in or whatever, with, um, just dogs and pe and people that can be around dogs and uh, they get to just, you know, run and run and run, right? Um, they're very happy. So I don't know. But I think, I mean, I don't know, pets are, are a way that a lot of people understand um, the value of connection with animals and living things that are different. And then there's Zeus, which I do enjoy. I have been, I, I used to live in San Diego, so I've been to arguably the world's best zoo, although one, definitely one of the world's best. Uh, you can also argue about what is the best, that's subjective, but it is a very, very high quality place. Um, but even there, right, the animals are, are, the animals are very well cared for, uh, but they're still kept in spaces that are much smaller than their natural habitats, where they don't really have any ability to roam. And you know, their quality of life varies depending on the specific species and how much that bothers them and also depending on how much room the zoo is able to give that particular animal. And again, it just depends and I think on balance it's good because it helps people see and appreciate these animals um, and it does help preserve some of the extremely endangered species. And it does provide a decent quality of life for a lot of the animals. But at the end of the day, the best thing is to sort of like have some respect for life, right? And it's like, weirdly, I'm not opposed to eating meat. Well, again, I said, you know, I'm not being judgmental here, right? But I think if you want to be truly consistent, uh, you should you should hunt and fish only for your meat. You should not or if you're going to uh, slaughter a farmed animal, you should farm it yourself. Or at very least, you know, you know, know the person. And when I say know the person, I don't mean like, oh, you know, you have like some fake friendship with somebody out in the countryside and then like you drive out there every, every couple of months and, and, you know, buy a bunch of beef and like, no, no, I mean like you actually live in the countryside and like, you know, you're just growing, you know, plant crops and your neighbor happens to have uh, cattle and you specialize in that. Yeah, so like, that's what I mean by like, you don't, not everybody uh, would has to, but, but if you really want to eat meat, I think, I think you should uh, hunt and fish. And if you're gonna hunt, you should hunt with a bow and arrow. Uh, and if you're gonna hunt with a bow and arrow, I guess there's not that many more caveats to add there, but uh, there is also this thing, right, about like sort of hunting on, uh, on these like hunt, hunting ranges where they like, keep a bunch of animals for you to hunt uh, and it's also kind of cheating right it's like meat is a naturally scarce thing right our ancestors used to have to spend a lot of effort to get a very small amount of meat when we were all hunter-gatherers and 
you know, there used to be this, we ate meat, but we had this sort of like psychological and emotional respect for that process and an understanding that, you know, we had to kill something and that that was not an easy thing to do. Uh, whereas now, you know, you can just go to the grocery store and, you know, sort of stuff your face with like whatever you want uh, for next to nothing. Uh, and, you know, the other thing is that, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, it's not supposed, it's not even supposed to be like you can, you know, it's supposed to take real effort, right? You're not even, you know, there's not supposed to be such a thing as a rich person that can just go, oh, I will go like buy the meat that is obtained by these like complicated means. It's like, no, 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 right? It's like, if you want to like effectively barter for, right? Is it, you know, like if you're in like a hunter gatherer tribe or something, right? It's like, you got to really like pull your weight some other way to get like, you know, and, and then you still just get your, your, your fair share. Um, but it, you know, it's very difficult to obtain and people spend a lot of effort on it. Uh, right. Uh, but I don't know. It, modern times, everything's out of whack and we have these factory farms where you can just get meat for next to nothing. And it's not supposed to be that way. But so, yeah, of course, I'm afraid that we are going to run into a situation where there's artificial intelligences that are far more capable than we are of managing matter and energy. And they just, again, I don't know what we'll be useful for. The best case scenario is actually where we're not useful for anything. And we're essentially just kept around in the equivalent of a nature preserve, um, presumably somewhere in Africa, because that's where uh, we actually evolved to live. Uh, maybe a, a couple of other places that people currently live, uh, hunter-gatherer lives that, well, actually there's not very many people in Africa, but, you know, maybe a couple, maybe a couple of other places like uh, New Guinea or deep in the Amazon where uh, it would be feasible to keep humans and without modern technology uh, in a sort of nature preserve. So that's the best case scenario, right? We're not useful for anything other than science and historical preservation and it just, like, make some nature preserves where like some small number of humans are able to survive uh, and it sort of keeps us in those areas well us you know it wouldn't be it would not be us us right it would not be people descended from uh, people living in modern civilization it would be people descended from people who still live a hunter gatherer lifestyle in those areas but that'd actually be the best case scenario where we're not particularly useful for anything and it just wipes most of us out and then leaves a handful of people in places like that but that's not very likely. What is far more likely is that we are useful for something, and I have no clue what it will be. Uh, maybe it's like the original draft of the Matrix script, right, where it needs our brains to perform some of the computations, uh, and so it, it, like, plugs us all into this horrible thing. Uh, or maybe it's, you know, maybe it is literally, it, it needs our, like, biological parts, and we get kept in something like, excuse me, factory farms, and then just, you know, torn apart the way we tear apart animals. You know, maybe it needs us to do some sort of intellectual labor. Um, and who knows, it could be anything. It could be most likely, I would say the most likely outcome is it is something, and it's something that uh, I have no understanding of or knowledge of because it's, they're, they're more intelligent, they're going to be more intelligent than us. Who knows? So, I don't know. There's a few reasons that people go vegetarian or vegan. Probably the biggest reason these days is environmental. And that's a perfectly good motivation. You know, definitely meat and dairy take, uh, especially meat, take a lot more energy to produce, right? Everybody learns in high school, middle school biology, right, that, you know, autotrophs, or sorry, heterotrophs only get about 10% of the energy they consume from either autotrophs, aka plants, or other heterotrophs, uh, other animals slash fungi. And so it's not a very efficient process. Um, that's why we don't really eat carnivores, right, except for some carnivorous fish. We don't, you know, like, why, why don't we, you know, why don't we raise 
carnivorous animals to eat well because then we would have to raise animals for them to eat and it's just you know adds you know inefficiencies all along the line and so yeah it's uh it's not particularly efficient to produce meat uh, and it's not the most efficient to produce uh, eggs or milk either um, it's in bit kind of in between the efficiency of uh, purely plant-based foods and the efficiency of meat on uh, exactly where in between depends on specifically how it's produced and specifically what animal pro what dairy product you're talking about so that's that's a major motivation is just environmentalism and another motivation is what originally motivated me which is sort of you know just I don't know, compassion for animals, right? If you're somebody that just, you know, feels, feels when you see a cute animal, you don't want to kill them and eat them. Uh, and you especially don't want to lock them in a cage and make them suffer horribly so that you can eat them uh, or, you know, eat products that are extracted from their existing that way. Although I guess, again, I do eat dairy, milk and eggs. But the third reason, and what has become my main reason, is this, right? This idea that, well, maybe if we build a world where we have compassion for things that are not as intelligent and powerful as us, then maybe when there's something more intelligent than us, then it won't be so bad for us, right? As I say, you know, the, the shoe will always land on the other foot eventually. Um, what goes around will always come back around someday you can't count on staying on top forever. You've got to build a world where not being on top doesn't mean that you're gonna have horrible things happen to you. So, I don't know. Maybe that'll help. Maybe we all go like perfectly vegan, spend all of our time building animal sanctuaries and nature preserves and AI comes along and does horrible things to us anyway. C'est la vie. Maybe artificial intelligence, as I'm thinking of it, never comes into existence. I mean, that scenario, you know, that really wouldn't be that bad at all because then we would have all of the spiritual and emotional benefits of taking care of everything. Uh, and without any horrible uh, potential consequences of building artificial intelligence. So, yeah, who knows? Maybe it'll be fine. Maybe it'll be terrible no matter what we do, but maybe, just maybe, uh, we can build a world that is good and safe for everything and then when we are the less intelligent and capable thing, not so horrible of things will happen to us. It's just a thought. Maybe it won't make any difference. Probably no one will listen to me anyways, but hey, look at this beautiful painting of an elk. Look at this magnificent animal and Remember, someday we are, well actually, best case scenario, someday we'll be the elk. Worst case scenario, someday we'll be the cattle. So maybe we should have a world where being a cow is not such a horrible prospect. Peace.